Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brad Pruitt, and on behalf of Pepper Crutcher, my co-president of the Federalist Society of Mississippi, I want to welcome you to today's very timely and significant discussion. The uh, Federal Society is uh, pleased that you could show up and consider, I think, what is uh, a pressing question in most of our minds as practitioners and bar members and citizens of this state. Is the Mississippi Bar doing enough to combat corruption and to protect the honor and integrity of the profession? Now, the Federal Society, if you're not aware, is a national group that was started by conservatives and libertarians to consider uh, issues of separation of powers and government policy uh, and also the rule of law. And the Federal Society was started back in the 1980s during the Reagan administration when liberals tended to dominate the law school landscape. The Federal Society decided an alternative venue of uh, ideas and a marketplace to consider those needed to be made available. And this grew into a lawyer's division uh, chapter uh, as well. And so they're all over the nation. At this year's uh, annual conference, we had over 2,000 people at the uh, banquet, which had several Supreme Court justices as well as the President of the United States. So we're glad to have this chapter here in Mississippi. And we've been blessed over the years to have very uh, respected or at least influential members of uh, the political scene, uh, the law profession, and of our bench. And I will sadly say that some of our programs have involved the uh, recent newsmakers. Our fir very first program as a lawyer's division chapter in this room 12 years ago involved a debate on contingency fees with Dickie Scruggs. And he was very effective in that and was very humorous, And although the scene has much changed now. Our program just a few months ago here was uh, featuring Joey Langston on the issue of the Roley, the state attorney general, and these private outsourced legal arrangements. And he was also very effective. But the program we have today is one that focuses on our bar. As a bar member, uh, someone who loves the bar and what it's done for our profession over the years, it's a, it's a question that, that is, uh, requires a lot of sincere thought and respectful consideration. But really what we're looking at today is, is as mandatory members of this bar, what is the de jure and de facto role that the bar has or has not played or should play in addressing or at least perhaps acknowledging the past, present, and maybe the future corruption scandals that have shaken the rule of law in our state, taken our profession to a new low in terms of public opinion and the confidence that the public has in our profession, and dealt our state's lawyers an extraordinary black eye nationally. And so why focus on the Mississippi Bar? Now, the National Federalist Society focused on the ABA many years ago. That was one, in fact, the, the meeting that kind of spurred me to, to get this chapter started with Pepper was back in 1994 in New Orleans, the ABA convention, and the Federal Society had what they called a counter meeting. And I, it was at that meeting that I met Ted Olson and his wife, uh, Barbara Olson. And they were very uh, influential in encouraging us to get this chapter going. Uh, compared to some state bars like Missouri, Mississippi's bar is largely apolitical, to our credit. Uh, we are not engaged in some of the far-flung uh, uh, fringe activities that a lot of the state bars have taken on. Our bar uh, has seemed to leave the special interest political activities to those subsidiary elements and their associations. Our bar puts out a great magazine, has a tremendous convention annually, has numerous CLE-sponsored events, has committees, uh, has focused, I think, very uh, commendably on uh, professionalism. And, uh, and during Katrina and its aftermath, our bar uh, organized uh, efforts under many uh, lawyers in this state, particularly some that devoted much attention to it, and aided those victims to their credit. But today's bar faces not a question of management, but a question of leadership. Uh, management guru Peter Drucker defines leadership as do, management is doing things right and leadership is doing the right thing. And so while our bar certainly manages to do a lot right, is our bar proving to be the leader we need, need at this grave moment? And so one question becomes, has the attempt to be so neutral and so nonpartisan produced 
an inert, morally impotent bar. Some might say that the recent problems are defined merely by individual actors, bad apples, and therefore escape the broader attribution to the bar as a whole. Of course, that's not the way the national media sees it. Headlines from the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and other commentators are, as an example, Jonathan Turley on January 10th says, at a minimum, the Scruggs trial will again focus attention on the Mississippi bar, which has taken quite a drumming since the Scruggs windfall and later controversies over special dealing between lawyers and friends in government. Wall Street Journal on December 26th titled Mississippi Tort Inc. But whatever the verdict, the prosecution is already doing a public service by exposing the incestuous relationship among prosecutors and trial lawyers in Mississippi. The Magnolia State is a case study in the collusion between the tort bar and state law enforcement officials to shake down corporate targets. Our larger point is that the bribery case against Mr. Scruggs isn't some shocking bolt from the legal blue. It is all too understandable given the habits of the Mississippi trial bar and its political patrons. I was reading my Wall Street Journal Monday evening, saw the next editorial which says the uh, Mississippi's tort bar culture in which bribery seems to have been a signature practice. And of course, I don't think that the uh, opinions of these writers is, is merely uh, isolated to the nation, but I think it's also shared here in our state. I've been interested to read comments from people, uh, respected professionals like Charlie Merkel and the Claren Ledger who said the public in Mississippi is very suspicious of the whole civil justice system and that's terrible. The other day we saw uh, in the Claren Ledger Grady Tollison, one of our state bar, former state bar presidents say, everybody I honor and respect is offended that anyone would try to corrupt the greatest system of justice in the world. I find it heinous. And of course, unfortunately our state journalistic community has not taken on this issue like others across the nation have. I'm, I'm sure probably a good portion of our audience here has logged on daily to the insurancecoverageblog.com and read our Oregon colleague out far away producing public documents and, and, and enabling us to get a, a view of what's happened beneath our eyes here. Uh, and, and now our state journalistic community seems to be picking up on it as evidenced by the January 15 editorial, Lawyer Scandal States System Begs for Reform, where the Claren Dudger says the citizens must have faith in their judicial system for it to work Mississippi's judicial system is now under the spotlight. It should be with an eye on reform. So what is it about this state that we love? I mean, I'm a 10th ten generation Mississippian. I love my state. I know y'all do. But why is it that we all so often seem to be just one step ahead of the banana republics of the world, where corruption and a few haves and a lot of have-nots seem to rule the day? We've had enough de jure warnings that this was headed our way. We've had the beef plant and we've had the Ike Brown case. We've had uh, convicted and now in prison super lawyer Paul Minor, Judge John Whitfield, who was president of my ends of court chapter when I was practicing on the coast, and of course uh, Chancellor, Chancellor uh, Judge uh, West Teal. So I would say that today's discussion is not oriented as Republican or Democrat, as a left or right, plaintiff or defense, black or white. These facts are what they are. Their convictions, their pleas, and their pending indictments, and for all the water cooler talk, more to come. They involve hugely significant, unavoidable members of our profession who reshape law practice here and across the nation through defense firms, revenue, and associate ranks, nationally spawned new case methodology, and then brought entire industries into our Mississippi courtrooms for adjudication. They engorged themselves in the resulting bounty, became gilded citizens through notable and namesake philanthropy at our universities and our athletic programs and beyond, and who, yes, are generally associated with certain bar segments. Sadly, they also involve those who wear the robe and hold the gavel. However, no matter what the orientation of one's practice or your politics, surely no one would condone or tolerate the continued excesses we witness being uncovered and the storyline that is being unraveled. Meanwhile, the federal government has intervened in Mississippi once again to clean up our mess, as we are not just injuring our own, but we have sway across the landscape of law, of investors, and of citizens. Is our bar association of today incapable of rousing itself in a substantive manner in the face of a moral disaster and a chronic illness within the profession, just as Mississippi 
of just a few decades ago tolerated, ignored, and illegally entrenched the blatant injustice of segregation. Baseball has its steroid scandal, and the Mississippi Bar has rapidly unfolding broad-based bribery scandal in its midst, and none of us knows how far it's going to go. As members of the organized bar, we are not the prosecutors, we are not the judge, we're not the juries, we're not here to try the cases that capture our attention and that of the nation, but under our bylaws we do have a responsibility. Article 1, 1 4, subsection D, to increase the public's understanding of the law and the role of the legal profession. 1 4 F, to assure the highest standards of professional competence and ethical conduct. 1 4 G, to serve as the state representative of the legal profession, and 1.4i, and to uphold the honor, dignity, and integrity of the legal profession. But is our bar exercising its responsibilities? Perhaps our distinguished panel can provide some answers. And we are joined by members of the bar whom we think reflect the diversity professionally, the uh, diverse segments of our bar in terms of their practice orientation. We've got leadership past and present, and we've got, I think, the most notable lawyer subsets represented. And I begin to my left here, Bobby Bayless, the current president of the Mississippi Bar Association, Vicksburg uh, practitioner, uh, commercial uh, business law uh, practice focus with the uh, firm of Wheelis, Shapley, Shapley, Bayless, and Rector. Of course, we have Mark Chin as well here, who's a preeminent divorce lawyer and a noted uh, practice innovator and he's with Chen and Associates here in Jackson. Buddy Coxwell, who's a past president of the Trial Lawyers Association. He's also a uh, noted film subject. Uh, was in a movie way back when, at least portrayed in one. He uh, is the uh, uh, head of Coxwell and Associates, the criminal defense lawyer, as well as a uh, plaintiff's lawyer. We have Wayne Drinkwater, who's a member of Bradley A. Rant, who's uh, probably one of our most distinguished intellects in the state bar was a Supreme Court clerk uh, way back when, and is, the, uh, is a noted defense uh, appellate and uh, litigator in the business area. We have Adam Kilgore as our general counsel of the Bar Association. And we have Scott Newton, who's a former uh, FBI agent as well as former federal prosecutor with the uh, law firm of Baker Donaldson. And then finally, we have Carlton Reeves, who is the uh, current state president of the Magnolia Bar Association and with the law firm of Pigott, Reeves, and Johnson. And he's also a former prosecutor with the federal government. And so I want to thank each of you for joining us, gentlemen. And we're going to proceed with these questions that uh, you were provided in advance for your preparation and consideration. So I'll just start with question one. Our state's history, and I'll start to my left, and y'all can speak up as you feel like you're prepared to answer and you want to answer. All of you don't have to answer to each question, but we can just kind of go organically here. Our state's history includes much of which we should be ashamed. Voting rights, denials, uh, and abuses, city and county government corruption, and most recently judicial bribery scandals. Are we ashamed? And if so, why have we needed federal intervention to clean up each mess and to police the integrity of our government, and in this case, our legal system? I'll start with you, President Bayless. <laughs> well, First, Brad, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm glad to be here to speak uh, really on behalf of Bobby Bayless and Bobby Bayless only, although I do also have the honor of serving as the president of the bar. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I have a little problem with the question that you asked, but um, and I did not have the time to to fully devote myself to trying to craft an answer that I would sit up here and read, but I'd rather answer from the heart. Uh, I'm, I'm not ashamed of Mississippi in any way. Let me get that clear. Uh, I'm sorry that Mississippi has the same sort of problems that other states have, and I'm sorry that uh, we are involved in this terrible tragedy that we have going on right now that is not obviously a tragedy in the sense that it is something accidental that has occurred to disrupt the peaceful lives of others. It's uh, obviously allegations that are things that um, were uh, concocted and, and uh, have happened that uh, I am shocked by, I am so sadly disappointed in, and 
uh, only have the, the hope that we all have the strength to not only get through it, but to do something that can prevent it. Uh, as to your question of, of why the federal government is involved, um, my own personal opinion there is uh, I'm glad for the help that they have uh, provided. I'm glad for the resources they have provided. And uh, it is my hope that uh, Mississippi takes the initiative to do what it has to do collectively to uh, get through this process. Uh, obviously, it is something that we have to do collectively. I don't have uh, the silver bullet, and I don't have uh, all the answers, but I have the confidence in Mississippi and the people of Mississippi. I have the confidence in the Mississippi Bar to do what needs to be done to to lead us out of this situation that we're in. And uh, I don't mean at all to dominate this conversation. I welcome comments from whoever. I'd like to speak on that. The uh, first part of the question uh, is certainly something worthy of discussion. And uh, having my roots in Macomb, Mississippi, uh, at once one of the finest places in the world to live and at the same time having some of the most um, disastrous uh, history you can imagine. It's something that's a part of my soul, to the answer to the first question, but it's not something I think I could, could uh, address today adequately. But the second part of the question I'd like to address. Um, have we needed federal invention to clean up? I think that it's very clear to everyone sitting here, federal invention, intervention has been perhaps the only intervention uh, in many circumstances. And I don't think it has to do with the character of the people sitting here or the character of the people serving in places. I think it has to do with a culture that we have to change. And cultures are hard to change. And it's hard to speak up when there is a certain culture because if you speak up, sometimes you're the only one, sometimes your job is at risk. Sometimes referrals from lawyers are at risk. Sometimes attitude of judges you face are at risk. Sometimes you're in trouble with neighbors. And it's difficult to change culture. But my observation is this. Uh, medicine is very important in our society. And everywhere you go, you see veritable cathedrals built to medicine. Millions, if not billions, of dollars expended trying to create the finest educational systems and the finest re, uh, resources for people to stay healthy. Our forefathers back in the 19th century and the 18th century, when who knows what their resources were, spent, it, it seems they must have spent 80% of their budgets on building courthouses, and they placed them in the very center of our communities. You don't have to look for a courthouse in Mississippi. You know where it is. It's in the center of town. And they built beautiful buildings and they built beautiful courtrooms. And from my perspective, we've done nothing since the 19th century from a state level to send a message to the public that the system of justice is the very foundation of everything we do. We know without our system of justice, without people's willingness to comply with laws, without lawyers and judges as much as we're maligned, we fall into an Iraq situation. Without our system of justice, we're nothing, and there's no place for the arts or for letters or for medicine. And we've lost the focus that the very thing that makes this country great is our system of justice. It bleeds out from the courtrooms to the fact that judges are not paid the salaries that they need to be paid. There's, that's been addressed to some extent. Judges are not provided with the support that they need. Most judges don't have law clerks. The practice that I practice, family law, Judges often function on their own, doing the best they can to get research together, to stay up with cases, to have their cases administered. It places a tremendous burden on these servants to try and handle tremendous problems without the support that they need to handle things properly. Cases are not administered. Uh, I don't practice in the federal system anymore, but I, I try to observe it. I know that in the federal system they take control of cases, it, it seems almost immediately, and someone's giving you a call and saying, what's this case about? And immediately you refer to a magistrate who's looking for what the true issues are and confining things and studying things, letting things roll on and on and on. 
In, instead, in the, in the family law system that I operate in, grave injustices result from people fighting over issues that are ridiculous and cases languishing on forever and ever and ever with needless, ridiculous continuances. And so I think that all comes from a failure to make the law the very heart of our society in Mississippi. There needs to be a push for people to understand that the courthouse is in the center of our community for a reason, and we need to go back to treating it that way. I mean, I, I, I agree what the two other speakers have said. I don't think that this particular scandal is unique to Mississippi. We could list scandals the rest of the day, whether they're corporate scandals, Enron, Global Crossings, whether they're the, corporate, the scandals in the Boston Police Department, the Los Angeles Police Department, that affect, affect fundamental rights of individuals just as much as these bribery scandals are affecting us. Uh, I, I disagree with the question uh, presented by the moderator that uh, Mississippi is somehow unique in this area. Uh, I'm certainly not ashamed of Mississippi. We've had federal intervention in the entire South. You had federal intervention in Boston when they had busing, when people up north pointed their finger at Mississippi because of the problems we had. Uh, I, I think it's a situation, and, and what I keep telling myself, that no matter how many laws you have, it really boils down to each individual in their mind and heart being the judge and the jury of their own conduct. And we can pass 10,000 more laws, and that's not going to stop someone if they commit a criminal act. And I'm, I'm, I'm greatly disturbed by this. I was talking to one of the speakers earlier, and he said he saw this coming. I didn't see it coming. I, it, it blew me out of the water to see people that I knew, and, and I speak only for the people that have entered pleas, because I'm going to give anybody else the presumption of innocence that I knew to be good lawyers, and, and even though I didn't know them well, the times I'd met them at conferences or seminars, seemed to be good people, to be in, involved in something that so fundamentally touches everything that I stand for and believe in that I, I can't even describe the level of shock. I didn't see it coming. Uh, the fact that the federal system is, is handling it uh, I mean, there have been, I think, in Operation Pretense, I think you had state and federal uh, officials working in it. I mean, we have a, a dual system of government, and sometimes the federal government is involved, and there's nothing wrong, there's nothing unique. Uh, maybe they need to be sometimes. So uh, I don't think it puts Mississippi in a unique position. It's certainly embarrassing uh, to our profession. Uh, but. It's not the topic of this discussion, but I think our profession, both on the plaintiffs and the defense side, has been done under assault for years. And to me, we haven't stood up. You know, whether you're a defense lawyer or a plaintiff's lawyer or whether you defend accused citizens, I don't think we've stood up enough for the in integrity of our profession. I think we've let ourselves get beat up. And, of course, this is a bad time to be to be bringing that issue up when we're being beat up again by what apparently is a, or individuals entering pleas to, to crimes that they actually committed. So uh, I, I'm not ashamed of Mississippi, and I think this problem will be solved, and the 99.9% .9 of the lawyers will continue conducting themselves appropriately. As, uh, as an aside, before I, I say what I think about this, I want to remind all of us that we are all Americans. And the government of the United States is our government. The government of the United States does not intervene in Mississippi when it enters Mississippi to enforce the laws of the United States. This is our government. And for one, I am proud and grateful to the government of the United States for doing the things that we've all seen the government do over the last several years. Having said that, though, it's obvious that the state of Mississippi also has a role to play in all of this. And speaking only for myself, I do not think that the state of Mississippi has played enough of a role in dealing with some of the events that we've all seen here today. I think this problem is much far beyond the resources of the Mississippi State Bar uh, to deal with. 
Uh, I think we all understand that the disciplinary proceedings of the state bar are triggered when lawyers or others make uh, complaints uh, to uh, the bar and then things move on from that. And on an individual case-by-case -case basis, I'm satisfied that the things that we're now seeing will be dealt with on an individual and case-by-case -case basis and that justice will be done. But I think that our state bar has an obligation to speak to the system, not just to individual cases. And I believe this is an outstanding opportunity for all of the people in this room to call on the governor, to call on the Chief Justice, the Speaker of the House, and the Lieutenant Governor to take advantage of what we're seeing now, perhaps to create a commission composed of members of the bench and the bar to review our, the entire structure of our civil and criminal justice system, not just the code of judicial conduct and not just the disciplinary proceedings uh, relating to lawyers, but also to look at the laws of the state of Mississippi, both statutory and constitutional, and to ask some questions about whether or not the way in which we have structured our civil and criminal justice system is likely, is likely to promote or reduce corruption and political influence. For example, does the election of state court judges, does that process electing judges, is that something that is likely to increase or decrease the opportunities for corruption and political considerations when those judges make decisions? As all of us know, the judicial branch of government is not intended to be a political branch. It is not intended to exist to move forward with political goals that are identified by other branches. The goal of the judicial branch is to ensure that all people who go into that system get equal justice under law. And I really think that this is an opportunity that may never come again in our state's history right now for, as I say, the governor, the chief justice, and members of the legislature to come together to try to address in a comprehensive way what I perceive to be maybe some structural problems with our justice system, which if enacted would never eliminate human corruption. Corruption will exist as long as there are human beings in the system, but would certainly try to make some changes in our laws to make it less likely that the things we're all now seeing and have seen for the last couple of years will occur again in the future. I believe that this is a time that we should have introspection, not only as individual lawyers and questioning what's going on and why, why things may be the way they are, but also as an, as an organization. I've uh, seen a unique thing happen as a result of this. First of all, I have always been proud to be a lawyer uh, and will continue to be. Uh, in the work that we do in our office, we see the worst of or the allegations of the worst of the profession. Uh, I spoke 40 times last year given ethics hours or, or something akin to that, and I try to each time remind people to be proud of, of who you are and the unique opportunity you get to play in society as attorneys, and we cannot forget that. At the same time, this introspection I think is a healthy thing, and I'm glad that these questions are being asked. Uh, the unique thing that I've seen as a result of this uh, has been uh, surprisingly uplifting is the number of people that are upset, as we should be. Uh, as you can imagine, the Mississippi Bar oftentimes acts as a sounding board. I'm upset about this, so I'm going to call the Office of General Counsel. I'm going to call the Executive Director, the Bar President. And that's part of the role we play, and I think it's an important one, because it does give us an opportunity to get our ear out there. Well, I'm not on the grounds every, every day. I'm not in, those, in that courthouse like you are, seeing the same things you're seeing. So I think it's valuable uh, to get that feedback. But most of what I've gotten in the last few weeks have been people responding uh, where you could almost hear their knees knocking on the other end of the line. They are so weakened by this and so upset by it. I think of the quality folks that devote a significant amount of time uh, to, to doing work not only for the bar, but also for their communities. I think of the people that 
no one ever is going to find out about uh, that are doing significant work behind the scenes. Um, and, and we can't forget that. At the same time, we do have to press forward and try to uh, continue to ask the healthy questions and try to make meaningful uh, choices as a result. I don't think it's time for the bar or anyone else to, make, to do some PR moves to try to make everybody feel better about what's happened. I think instead it's time for t to take meaningful action just as it was time to take meaningful action on, on everything else that we look at, uh, at at the bar. So again, I think it's a time for us to be looking, and I'm glad we are. Brad, I want to thank you for having this panel and for allowing me to be on it. Um, with regard to federal intervention, uh, public corruption cases certainly raise difficult federalism questions. Um, the sovereignty concerns include whether one sovereign criminalizing the conduct of someone acting under the auspices of another sovereign. The corruption that we're, we're seeing today undermines the fundamental premise of federalism. The threat to, to federalism is not necessarily to the state, it's to individual liberty embodied in federalism. And that's what must be protected. Our founding fathers established federalism to enhance the lives of individuals by making government work better, by not allowing the unchecked abuse of power. So I think these prosecutions actually advance the cause of federalism rather than undermining it. With regard to, uh, Merida and I talked the other day, the role of the federal government uh, or one sovereign or the other in certain cases. Um, it, it may be appropriate for one sovereign in certain cases, carjackings, uh, certain violent crime cases, for one sovereign or the other to take the lead to be the, the sovereign that's going to prosecute the case. Public corruption cases, however, are different. Public corruption cases go to the integrity of government. They go to the public perception of government. And therefore, if state laws are violated in public corruption cases, the state of Mississippi has a fiduciary duty to the public to prosecute these cases. And I'm not surprised uh, by these cases. We've had cases that have shown us that these were coming, not necessarily with these individuals. We've seen Fin Fin, we've seen Paul Minor, we've seen other corruption cases here. And we need to see the state of Mississippi play a greater role and be at the table as these cases are being investigated and prosecuted, and that is not occurring right now. Uh, Brad, I guess thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, or asking me to participate on this panel as well. I guess the first thing that I would say is that uh, Integrity can't be bought. That is not a consumable item. It cannot be bought. It doesn't matter whether you're appointed to the bench or elected. Because I know what this is going to result in. It's going to be a high state gamble now saying that all judges in the state uh, should be appointed. That the, political, the politicization ends with an appointment. We know any monies that go to the election of judges will simply be transferred to the appointing official or officials. So we know that it's a high stakes gamble even in the appointment process. The Magnolia Bar has been out front with respect to diversity in the federal judiciary as well as the state judiciary. Uh, so uh, I don't believe that the, the knee jerk response ought to be to say that all judges ought to be uh, appointed because of because somebody lacks integrity on the front end. There are many things that ought to upset the bar, whether it's taking money or bribes and members of the bar. We see people every day 
who are wrongfully convicted of things, and prosecutors stand by silently and do nothing. Sometimes prosecutors play a role in it. There's no reason in the world why there ought to be an innocence project, for example, to uncover things where people who have been wrongly convicted. That means somebody played a role in putting up the evidence. There's one thing that's worse than a, in my view, as worse than a corrupt cop. And that's a corrupt judge because a corrupt, the corruption or the corruptiveness of the cop can be blocked by that judge. What do we have in this system that's going on now? We have a Supreme Court that's overreaching and overturning and reversing and rendering every multi-million dollar verdict, every high verdict that they have simply wiped away the value system of the jury. You can look back over the last couple of years, and that may be the Supreme Court's view of trying to clean up what they figure is a broken system. But anytime you reverse and render a case simply because the dollars are high or, or what's viewed to be the dollars are high, you're reversing and rendering every case that comes before you, then that also, in the minds of some lawyers, see that that's a, a, a problem there. So. We should not gang up on the idea that the way to straighten out this process will be to reform the system by saying that judges who are elected lack integrity, and those judges and the appointed officials who do the appointments have all the integrity that there is to have. Uh, the only other thing is is that we, we have to always be mindful, and I was looking at this panel, for example. Obviously, absent from this panel is any woman. I mean, the diversity, the idea of diversity of inclusion brings about change and understanding the, the values that people bring into the courtroom or the lack of value that people have. Because again, integrity can't be bought. And the the, the circumstances that, that are swirling around right now all boils down to a lack of integrity, not some viewpoint, not anything else, but a lack of integrity. Thank you. We're going to focus now on ethics enforcement at the state bar level. I think there are two components to this. One is our self-policing role as lawyers, and the other is the official role of the bar as a, as a policing element. And so. Before you have the second question, or the it's number four on the list, recent scandals involving lawyers have prompted some to question whether Mississippi bar ethics enforcement is adequate. If it is true that a certain degree of discreet corruption has been acceptable among Mississippi lawyers, what could the bar have done to root it out? And I would just add to that, what can the what should the bar do? Should there be a shift of resources in, more into CLE or disciplinary enforcement? And you know how do we produce within the bar a, a sense of uh, that we're incensed enough to try to make a change amongst ourselves and change the culture? Who wants to start with that? I'll answer that. I refuse to accept that there has been a uh, acceptance on behalf of our attorneys. Uh, of uh, some minimal level of corruption, and then if it rises to a certain level, we'll stand up. Uh, and to suggest otherwise, I think, is offensive. In the work we do as the, at the bar, as I said earlier, we see the worst of the, of the lawyer conduct or the allegations thereof. Uh, and, and again, see people serving in, in integral roles in their society and, and, and uh, also uh, uh, doing work for the bar. The important thing to remember is that while the bar is a designated disciplinary agent of the Supreme Court, acting under the Mississippi Rules of Discipline as it relates to the attorney discipline process. We, in effect, under Rule 8.3 of the Mississippi Rules of Professional Conduct, are also agents of the court. You have a duty to report to the bar if you are aware, if you have actual knowledge of another attorney that has committed an ethics violation. So again, if there are people that have been sitting idly by watching some minimal level of corruption go on and not worry about it, then we're all to blame not just the Mississippi Bar Association, all of us. So I encourage you to do that. We receive 
phone calls on an almost daily basis where attorneys are taking this role seriously and calling about what their obligation in, is under Rule 8.3, and we help them with that analysis. We also, on, on about a weekly basis, receive something in writing from an attorney where they are reporting under 8.3, and they provide us with information uh, to support it. They certainly don't have to prove the case. They just need to provide us with some meaningful information. If you send me a one-sentence letter saying you think something bad's going on, you know, we're not going to devote our energy to go figure out what it is you're trying to tell us. You need to provide us with meaningful information to do it. We had 14 bar complaints filed in the last few months based upon 18 uh, 8.3 submissions. Uh, again, those are things we regularly discuss on the telephone, and we welcome your phone calls regarding that. Mark. How would you know I wanted to talk? I could see you moving. <laughs> There's no answer on this, and I realize that there are books and articles and viewpoints that are in one sense are all correct, but I think that from the standpoint of our rules of professional conduct, from the standpoint of our legal education, from the standpoint of, way we, of the way we think, the emphasis on the way we practice law is the adversary system. The, the notion that one lawyer's job is to advocate one cause and the other lawyer's job is to advocate the other and somehow truth will come out of it. And I've had many people say to me, what is your one loss record? How, how have you done? How have you succeeded in court? And, and for me, court is not a place to play a game or to win something or to win a divorce case, or to win a personal injury action. For me, a place, a court is a place to resolve a civil dispute civilly so we don't shoot each other. And I think, there's, I think there is a culture within this profession which is honored because it's the adversary system that says that we can shave fine lines, that we can justify an omission, that we can justify uh, not quite answering something truthfully because that's our job to advocate on behalf of a client. And I don't know the answer to this, but I can tell you in my firm when the question arises and we talk to each other about how we're going to respond to something, we ask each other what's our number one value and it's integrity. And so we're going to answer the question sometimes when it isn't asked, and we're going to give the stuff when it isn't asked for, because the system of justice and the honor of the profession is more important than shaving a line that you can get away with in litigation and then hiding behind the obligation to advocate for your client. Now, I can take that position one day and get a bar complaint filed against me, and I may lose. But you know what? I'm going to do it anyway. I don't think I really don't think there's much the bar short of what y'all are already doing can do proactively to prevent um, this type of corruption um, maybe uh, make other than maybe making referrals to law enforcement but this is a it's a law enforcement issue um, public corruption cases are done uh, they're conspiracies they're they're done uh, secretively um, and and I don't I don't think uh, there's there's much other than what the bar's doing now they can do. Uh, again, it's a law enforcement issue. If I can just jump in for a minute, the bar does have the authority and ability to interact uh, with the federal or state, state authorities uh, and, and have from time to time done so uh, and will continue to do so. Uh, you know, there's been uh, some conversation before about uh, ethics seminars and what we can do to try to prevent this. Uh, I don't think the 40 times I spoke last year, if I had stood up and said, don't steal money out of your trust account, don't bribe a judge, don't commit a crime, that it would have prevented anything. We still have an obligation to be aware of what the rules and laws are regarding society. Uh, again, we welcome any insight that anybody has. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious and have an open uh, mind and ears uh, to any meaningful uh, suggestions that people have regarding that. I want to direct a, a follow-up question to Wayne and to Merida because they function frequently in the mass tort area. And do you think that the economics of a lot of these cases, the staggering sums that can be uh, following an attorney or a practice 
in these uh, different mass tort uh, cases that they somehow produce a, a kind of a benign response to self-policing. And, you know, some of the cases we're seeing are actually lawyers suing themselves who are co-counsels or partners. And so it's, it's not just an adversarial thing that's the initial breeding ground. Brad, I wouldn't want to say that just because a case is big and important that that is, makes it more likely that lawyers will be crooks. I, I really hadn't found that uh, to be true. Uh, I do think that in the mass tort area, there have been a lot of shortcuts procedurally, some of which started out to be necessary shortcuts because of the nature and the way in which the cases uh, were handled and that probably just kept on going. But I must say there seems to be an assumption in some of your questions that Mississippi lawyers somehow had public knowledge that these or similar acts were going on and that we simply have not reported them to appropriate authorities. I will represent to you that the things that we are now seeing in the newspaper and the things that we saw last year in the federal criminal prosecutions that occurred in Judge Wingate's court are not publicly available information. Uh, these things exist in large part because they are secret. No one knows about them. The kinds of things that would be available for action by lawyers in respect to the Mississippi Bar would relate much more to things like taking judges to Ole Miss football games. It would be on about that level. It has nothing or much to do with what we've been talking about today. Uh, Brad, I, I, I agree with Wayne and, and can't add a lot to that. I don't necessarily think uh, that we want to call it the mass tort area calls this. I mean, we've had class actions in the federal system for years, and, of course, there have always been complaints about those, too, about whether the consumer got what they needed in a class action. And uh, I, I don't think that's it alone. I, once again, uh, I think it's a situation of uh, particular individuals. All right. I'll just, I'm sorry, Brad. I'll just add the point. Uh, one one of the uh, uh, premises is that the state has not done what it needs to do, uh, and that the feds have. Although I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office, my exclusive role primarily was on the civil side. But there are federal statutes that speak to addressing these issues that are far better crafted than state statutes, I do believe. I mean, that's why you defer to the federal government on, on many of these types of cases, because by uh, there, there may be a gap or, or whatever in, in state law with respect to uh, uh, some of these type, kinds of crimes and the sentences that you can impose uh, uh, for any conviction. I, I agree with Carlton to some extent on that. Um, the state of Mississippi does have a, a limited role in historical investigations. They have a, a two-year statute of limitation on these cases, which, which is something that should be changed. Um, maybe if you get your, the, uh, your commission appointed, that'd be something they could look at. But the, the two-year statute of limitations limit historical cases when, under the in federal cases, you can typically go back five years and if, if you have conspiracies you can go back uh, much further than that to to uh, investigate these cases I think the issue here though is these cases are in front of us right now we're not talking about cases that are two years old and um, the state of Mississippi is not prosecuting them well, we're talking about a case that one of the allegations here something occurred in 1994 that's 13 years old I mean I don't know what case a person has seen in the last year, the last six months, yesterday? I mean, if you have, yes, you have an obligation to report it, and the bar needs to do what it needs to do, or the federal authorities need to do, or the state authorities need to do what they need to do. Uh, but but I, I simply refuse to say that there are many, or to believe that there are many lawyers sitting back watching other lawyers do commit illegal acts, or other public officials commit illegal acts. Because again, integrity can't be bought. And if and if there are those in power and 
and authority who are uh, violating the public trust, then they need to bring themselves to justice. I agree with that. I, I can't disagree with the concept of integrity can be bought or not bought, but you can create an environment where integrity is more likely. I've got a daughter playing high school basketball, and depending on how the refs call the game, the game can either be really rough or it can not be rough. It depends upon the environment that's created. Our state court system, in my experience, it doesn't create from every, from top to bottom, a, a level of you can't mess with this. This is the state of Mississippi. You can't mess with us here. This is justice. This is at the focal point of our society. There are ceiling tiles falling in. There are courtrooms where, where people can't even go to, to meet. The juries are, are sent uh, off to find parking places, places wherever they can. Uh, there's not an environment that this is a place where the hallowed ground of Mississippi is protected because this is our system of justice. Discovery abuses are just waved off. When's the last time you saw a state perjury prosecution? We just wave it off and we go on and we let, uh, here's a cookie for you, here's a cookie for you, now go on. And there's no, there's no hallowed ground in these courthouses and I think our forefathers in the 19th century tried to create that and we stopped somewhere along the way. But Mark, do you feel like it's uh, Rudy Giuliani often talked about fixing the broken windows? I mean, a broken window might not be a serious crime, but do these small indiscretions lead up to larger ones ultimately, if not enforced? Couldn't have been said better than that. Any other comments on that question? Well, I'll lead to the uh, question of the bylaws, which we introduced to the guests here and just reminded them of 1.4 I and G, which is I is to uphold the honor, dignity, and integrity of the profession, and G, of course, relates to the bar being the state representative of the legal profession. So we know that the bar this week on Monday, I believe it was, on the 14th, put out a one-page press release, uh, which was entitled The Statement on Recent Pleas and Indictments and spoke to this issue, these cases that have been so attention grabbing. So the question I pose to some of y'all is, is in light of this total silence up until this point, and despite the mounting scandals and what amounts to two years of judicial bribery cases, if you go back, I guess, to the beginning of the minor case, uh, has the bar actually served its purpose in this, with this bylaw? Is it actually executed on what it's expected to do? <coughs> I think the uh, I think this is a question for others to answer. I think it's time for the bar to listen, and so I'm going to do that. But I will say, uh, without hesitation, the bar stands by the work it does in matters regarding to ethics, uh, professionalism, access to justice, and legal aid to the poor, and we're going to continue to do those things. What else can the bar do to ensure its relevance in this responding to this crisis beyond the one-page press release? Uh, Mr. Pruitt, I'd, I'd welcome your suggestions on it because, you know, as, uh, as evidenced by our one-page one release, we've uh, proceeded in the fashion we felt appropriate uh, given the set of circumstances, given the, the uh, fact that we have some people that have uh, pled guilty and other people that have only been indicted. Well, I guess uh, one question is, was the bar, did the bar not feel it was necessary to respond to some of the national press? Who is to represent our profession? And uh, there seemed to be a lot of questions that were raised in reading these quotes that seemed to cast the light on the Mississippi bar as a profession, as a professional group, a geographic group, not just an isolated group. So did, does the bar feel it any way responsible for responding to that point? I mean, to protect the 99% of us, as someone said, who are innocent and practice in an honorable way with ethics? You know, I'm still a little confused on what you're shooting for here. Uh, the bar has certainly been responsive uh, anytime the media contacts us. I've got a, a 215 appointment with WLBT today. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, again, there are certain limitations uh, for the bar acting as a designated disciplinary agent of the court. I think it's important to remember uh, Rule 15 of the Mississippi Rules of Discipline 
deals with confidentiality. So there is uh, certainly times, yesterday Mr. Bayless and I were on uh, a, a local radio program, actually it was a statewide program, uh, and they were asking some questions related to the matters that have recently gone on. Uh, other than addressing the, the uh, two uh, attorneys that uh, entered guilty pleas uh, that have irrevocably resigned, uh, which we have uh, then filed that with the court and that will go into effect once the court rules on it, uh, we're extremely limited on what we can talk about. Uh, so again, you know, we certainly take it seriously, but uh, there's there's only certain aspects of it that we can cover. And, and Brad, was it Benjamin Franklin or one of the early filing fathers who said, "Don't get into an argument with a person who owns an inkwell"? I mean, what would you have the bar do in these circumstances? I mean, would I like to see the bar spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in commercials? about the integrity and the worthwhileness of lawyers and attorneys in general? And the, yes, I'd love to see that. Do you want your bar dues to be $2,000 a year? Would I like to see resources diverted to that? I absolutely would. I mean, you see the medical profession doing it everywhere. You see the signs hanging from UNC. You see the billboards. I mean, you know, I'm, you know, kind of embarrassed to say that other than my son, I don't put anything else first in my life than this, this job. And I put it first until I, ha you know, have that child. So, yeah, I'm frustrated, but what do you want the bar to do? Do you think we, they has millions of dollars to spend on an advertising campaign? I mean, I, I think that if, if there are some suggestions from members out here, I'm sure the bar would like to hear it. But I don't know what else the bar can do other than... Uh, to police the members after the fact the same way statutes, criminal statutes do. Let me jump in and just add one quick thing and then I promise I'm going to listen like I said I wanted to. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, uh, and I don't have numbers to back this up, but it is my understanding the Florida Bar spent a significant amount of money uh, a few years back on public relations. Um, they saw zero benefit from it based upon what they looked at afterwards. Again, I don't have numbers to provide for you, uh, but it's my understanding that's the case. The best public relations that we can do, again, are, are the individuals. Certainly your bar association has a role in doing that, and, and we're, we're not passing that off to you. But it's you and the way you treat your clients. It's you and it's the dignity and respect that you treat that person on the other side of the deposition. It's the things that you do in your communities. Those are the only things, in my opinion, that are going to truly change the perception. Everyone's frustrated about how lawyers are beat up about this or that, and I hate lawyer jokes. I understand those sentiments. I don't like them either, and I tend to walk away, but I don't make a big deal out of it, uh, because what's that going to do other than bring more attention to the very thing that they're complaining about? Fred, let me return to something I said earlier, principally because I want to see if I can get another rise out of Carlton. <laughs> If, if someone had asked me a year and a half ago what I thought the chief failings in our state court system were as they relate to the impartial administration of justice, I would not have told you that I thought that state court judges were taking bribes. I would not have said that. I do not now believe that that is a statistically significant problem in our state courts. I would have said, and I think now, that there is a laxity, a familiarity in the state court system that does permit, following up on what Mark Chin said, that does permit lawyers and litigants to take maybe small liberties in the state court system in a way that does, simply does not happen, or often typically does not happen, in the federal system. So what, what is next for the bar as it approaches this issue? Have you got a plan or? Is there something that these members can look to going ahead beyond this release? Or Brad, there is no plan uh, today as we speak today. Um, uh, obviously, this is an, an enlightening meeting that we're having today. I, I, I knew Adam Kilgore's stance on everything because I've listened to him several times uh, since you invited us to attend. Uh, a couple of things, and I've wanted to, to speak earlier and, and didn't to, to, to uh, so as not to interrupt the, the flow of this thing, but, and some of this will be repetitious, but, you know, we are the bar. 
Uh, and the bar is nothing without each one of us. And if we don't commit ourselves to do what has to be done to make the bar what it's got to be in order to make these kind of decisions, then we're nothing. Uh, we can split up and get into plaintiff's bar and, and defense bar and uh, the bar, and um, that's not going to accomplish anything. Um, I, I hesitate to take a, as strong a stance as Wayne has taken because uh, as president of the bar, I want the cooperation of all the bar to try to get done what has to be done so that we can, as well as possible, eliminate what has happened here. And, and I, I said yesterday, and uh, I'll, I'll say it again, if uh, I hope and pray that uh, what's going on right now uh, uh, out of Oxford uh, is an isolated incidence in which the two judges' names who, who have been used are, uh, uh, both did what the ju judiciary is supposed to do, which is, although a bribe was offered, allegedly, uh, uh, they took no part in that. It is impossible to look into the future to see how these, these alleged criminal acts would have occurred. And uh, Brad, I've heard you say that you saw this coming and uh, I did not. I was shocked. Uh, I am disappointed. I'm angry about it. Um, practicing law is a privilege uh, and it's a duty. And if you'll go back and read your oath that you all took, and I encourage you to do that, uh, I encourage you to read the rules of professional conduct periodically. If you don't do it, you're, you're, um, you're coming up short. Uh, I encourage you to go back and read, read the rules of discipline. You, you, um, we get busy, uh, and I'm as bad as anybody about that. You, we get busy and we get focused on what it is we've got to do today, and we forget or don't take the time to try to make sure that this profession and the honor that it has enjoyed in the past and hopefully the honor that it will enjoy in the future is protected. And the only way, the only possible way that we can protect it is if each one of us are doing what we've got to do. Uh, Adam mentions the Rule 8.3. If you haven't read it recently, you need to go read it. If you have let uh, an infraction go by when you had knowledge or reason to believe that there was a problem and you did not report it, you are to blame. You have responsibility to do that. Um, the, the bar is not a criminal agency. It is not the enforcer of criminal laws. It is a, it is a bar, to start with, who is charged with the responsibility by the Supreme Court of Mississippi to discipline attorneys who have acted poorly or acted inappropriately. I don't believe the bar is shirking that responsibility, Brad. Um, I've had enough experience with uh, the general counsel's office, um, Adam and and uh, Gwen and Jim and and uh, Glenn. Uh, we are they are a hard working crew who are dedicated to doing what's right for Mississippi, for lawyers, and for the bar, and for the betterment of you. But I'll say it again, we can only be as good as we each individually are. Closing thoughts, Mark? 
Any other? I don't think it applies to uh, plaintiff's work, defense work, and I don't think it applies to big cases. I think it goes across the board. Uh, they, they said on Channel 2, I believe, this morning that 85 percent of our public in Mississippi has lost faith in our judicial system. Eighty-five percent. And what we need to address is the fact that whatever, and, and I thought what Bobby said was really important to say, the judges did not uh, become involved in this. They reported it. So from the standpoint of the honor and integrity of our, of our system, what better way for it to be acknowledged than for them to stand up in the face of becoming involved in something like this and still report it. But I think, it, uh, I think our situation goes deeper. I'd like to see us look into the fact that judges are subjected to getting phone calls from people. They're subjected to getting letters from people. They're subjected to running into people in church. And at the risk of taking a position that's political, which I rarely like to do, I think we have to take a strong look at how we select our judges. Merida. Brad, I, I, I really don't have anything to add. Uh, I think I've said everything. Wayne. No, just thank you for asking us. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, nothing to add. Brad, I'd like to thank you for having us. But, but also, I would say, uh, with regard to what Wayne said, that I think one, one case is statistically significant. Um, you know, whether, whether we're talking about the entire judiciary, one case is that important. So that may be why we have the 85% number right now. And the only thing that I would say is that if this commission does come, Wayne, um, <laughs> uh, that there should be vigorous debate uh, simply because if you look back at it, and we can go back at the last eight years under the current administration on the state level, uh, that is Governor Barber and even Governor Musgrove, and you look at the number of judicial vacancies that we had, and you look at the number of diverse appointments, I'm talking about black lawyers who were appointed, who were appointed to the judge as judgeships, uh, for judgeships. And if you're talking about on a lifetime, if you're talking about a lifetime appointment on the state side, uh, that would be pretty hard to stomach here in Mississippi. On the federal side, we see what lifetime appointments have gotten the African American attorneys. So I mean, so we, uh, we. I, I do welcome the debate, and Wayne and I talk about these kind of things all the time. <laughs> well, I, I really think this has been a productive panel discussion. I don't have any suggestions, Adam. That's why I'm a... <laughs> that's, that's the moderator's uh, role, just to sit back and listen. But I think the questions, while a little bit uh, touchy and uncomfortable, they need to be asked. I think our bar is more is profited by these type of questions. We love the bar. We, we intend to continue practicing after this. And so let's, uh, let's keep that in mind. I think that just as, uh, as Mark uh, cited, our bar disintegrates a lot of times in interest groups, parts of the practice that we gravitate towards. Instead of an us and them mentality as we go back to our offices and our homes, we need to start thinking about right and wrong. That's where the demarcation ought to be going forward after this program. And I uh, thank Larry Houchins, our very devoted executive director of the bar, and all the staff of the bar who uh, do such a great job. We have a lot to be proud of. We do need to keep that in mind as we go ahead. I thank you all all for coming today, and have a good, good e evening and afternoon. Thank you.